Christopher Marlowe as a poet. His poetry is a poetry of intense passion. Marlowe is the first great English poet and creator of English blank verse. His work was cast by accident and caprice into an imperfect mold of drama. His plays in reality are poetry and he, his heroes are poets. His rude tamburland is essentially a poet. Dr. Foster's too is highly poetic in the expression of his love for beauty. Was this the face that launched a thousand ships? But the Edward the second lacks those beautiful touches of poetic fervor which we find in his earlier tragedies like Tamburlaine and Dr. Faustus. Yet we do not find it utterly devoid of that gift altogether. There is nothing prosy and commonplace in it. It is still, it is still attracts our admiration. His poetry is typically renasha in the tone and character. It has graceful diction, charming meter, beautiful similes and allusions taken from classical literature. We find it in it an uncontrollable passion for an idea, the scorn for worldly conditions, a soaring passion and seeking to scale the infinitudes of power, beauty, thought and love. He is preeminently a poet of passion. His heroes are men of men capable of great passions consumed by their desires and given to the pursuit of their lusts edward the second is given to sensual pleasure he is infatuated with gaveston and cares not for his kingdom and his wife isabella gives vent to his passion for gaveston in a highly poetic manner. The king regards me not, but dotes upon the love of Gaveston. He claps his cheeks and hangs about his neck, smiles in his face and whispers in his ears. <clears throat> Whenever the emotion is highly strung, it at once reaches a lyrical height in expression. Nobody can say that the speeches, particularly of Edward II and Isabella, are not sufficiently poetic. When the king is forced by the Archbishop of Canterbury to sign the orders of Gaveston's banishment, he goes mad with rays and swears destruction on the Church of Rome. Why should a king be just subject to a priest? Proud Rome that hatchets such imperial grooms. I will fire thy crazed buildings and enforce the papal towers to kiss the lowly ground. When the king is in passion, whether of sorrow or anger, he burst forth in the exuberance of poetic speech and the following lines give went to his sorrow for Gaveston. My heart is in and will unto sorrow, which beats upon it like the cyclops hammers and makes me frantic for my Gaveston. When the king receives the news of Gaveston's death in the hands of Warwick, Edward rises the most dizzy heights of poetry in the expression of his royal wrath sorrow and desperation in the following lines. By earth, the common mother of all, by heaven and all the moving orbs thereof, I will have heads and lives for, for him, as thereof many, as I have mansions, castles, towns and towers. King Edward's abdication and death make a lasting impression 
on our hearts and minds and his memorable lines become a part and parcel of our memory they so appeal to our sympathies that our hearts and minds and his memorable lines become a part and parcel of our memory they so appeal to our sympathies that our hearts run out to the king in his sorrow and dejection the gifts of private men are soon allied but not of kings the forest deer being a struck runs to an herb that closeth up the wounds but when the imperial lion's flesh is gored he rends and tears with his wrathful paw edward becomes far more poetic in his expression when the moment for the surrender of his crown arrives hey like like a sister way how hardly i can brook to lose my crown and kingdom without cause <clears throat> to give ambitions more timer my right but soon he submits to his des- destiny but what the heavens appoint i must obey here take my crown the life of edward ii in the murder scene a su- superb climax is reached the unhappy king has been made to stand in knee deep mire and puddle without sleep and food he remembers his past days of love and glory tell isabella the queen i looked not thus when for her sake i ran at tilt in france and there unhorsed the duke of clermont the horror of the scene goes on increasing and the king is murdered at last charles lamb has remarked with regard to the death scene in edward the second the death scene of marlowe's king moves pity and terror beyond any scene ancient or modern with which i am acquainted we find echoes of the voice of tamburland in the proud utterances of young mortimer who rises to some height of triumph the prince i rule the queen do i command the proudest lord salute me as i pass i seal i cancel i do what i will but soon he falls down and curses his fate in a highly poetic manner base fortune now i see that in thy will there is a point to which when men aspire they have tumble headlong down that point i reached and that point i touched on the whole it may be said that marlowe was the father of english dramatic poetry in the sense in which chaucer was the father of english narrative poetry his greatest gift to elizabethan drama was a poetry of passion he has given vent to all human passions for love beauty hatred and remorse in a highly poetic manner in his plays Marlowe's first great contribution to Elizabethan drama was the introduction of blank verse to the unpolished Elizabethan stage. The term mighty line means the use of blank verse. Blank verse is technically known as unrhymed iambic pentameter. Each line is divided into 5 feet and each foot consists of the two syllables the first is accented the other is unaccented the earl of surrey first introduced it in his translation of virgil's aeneid in blank verse of the scenican school each line ended with a strongly accented syllable and stood by itself separated by a pause from the preceding and following verses he altered the structure of the meter varied the pauses and produced an entirely novel rhythm of surpassing flexibility marlowe found the blank verse 
Marlowe found the blank verse of the literary school monotonous, tame, nevertheless without life or movements, but he left it unpolished. Uh, he, he left it polished. The chief characteristic of Marlowe's blank verse is the run-on lines which do not end with a pause. Marlowe avoided the monotony of the blank verse used by any other poet. He unlocked the secrets of the verse and taught the successors how to play upon its hundred stops. The blank verse of the earlier forms followed as stiff rules and rigid regularity, Marlowe filled the blank verse with music and poetry and broke away from the rigidity of rules. The poetic beauty is well found in his poem Marlowe and Leander, which was left unfinished because of death of Christopher Marlowe. Please like, give comments, share and subscribe.